Hello, good people of the Illuminati, and welcome back to the Shade Chamber, where we're bringing you our season finale, our summary wrap-up, and our thoughts going into Fontaine. I just spent a lot of time meticulously editing a live stream, and from now on, the only C word I'm gonna say is C. Beefy. I'm Brake, and if you're itching for the waves, the only lotion is the ocean. Coming in with the tide, it's Mr. Worldwide. Jer. Now I'm the bourgeoisie scum being marched to the Fontaine Research Institute. Wander. Yeah, he is. Uh, sadly, Rad couldn't be here with us in the Shade Chamber tonight. They are recuperating from a violent run-in with something called a red chuck of bow And uh, have you ever eaten a uh, red chuck bow I know you've eaten regular chuck bow right? Yes. Yeah, it's like that, but it's a lot meatier. <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, God. Right, good setup, good setup. Did not see that coming. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> Are you gentlemen ready to walk la rue à l'hydro? <laughs> oui! Woo! We'll get into it in a bit, but first, before we move on from the versions 3 point somethings, we just want to do a lightning round of topics we didn't cover yet. First of all, Gwent's in Impact. Genius Invocation TCG is no longer just a meme, but in fact, it is a dream new form of gameplay right here in your Genshin game. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, <laughs> over the course of version three, we did see Genshin Invocation TCG come in as kind of a fully fledged parallel developed game mode to Genshin. That is going to be something that they keep doing for the foreseeable. Yep, we know that uh, Hoyoverse used an outsource studio and the development cycle for this was pretty hectic. One of the devs at the Outsource studio who worked on it said that, like, the pace on this development was absolutely breakneck, like, at least double the pace of what it would take to develop out a whole ass card game. So far, that's the only kind of external impression we have of working with Hoyoverse. In a very old episode, we talked about Hoyo's global expansion going from MiHoYo to Hoyoverse and starting to set up satellite studios overseas. This is the first known outsourced work that's a major gameplay mode, um, and it makes a lot of sense. A TCG is self-contained enough to be pretty like confidently developed as a satellite dev team with minimal oversight from the main branch. It uses the 2D animatic art style, which everyone loves. Um, no one's going to pass up a chance to see some of that. It's also certainly a more phone-friendly gameplay mode. How, much, like, how did you guys engage with it when it came out? Not a lot until the Genius Invocation TCG event that introduced Charlotte and had the uh, Traveler globe trotting again to basically pick up the trail of card thieves across different nations. That said, uh, it did get me to use my phone a little bit more um, yeah. for uh, the sake of playing the TCG, because honestly, it's better as a pickup game on mobile than it is using a controller or on PC. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And for my part, I had similar experiences where I really didn't engage with it at all up until the lead up to the event, uh, again, the globe trotting event with Charlotte. Um, with that said, it is fairly intuitive as a system. It does a good job kind of um, existing relative to the primary gameplay in the game. Yeah. So much so that, like, even the challenges um, in that event, um, without having prior experiences, like, I had a fine time beating them. It wasn't too much of a challenge, just because it's... Well, know, speak yeah. for yourself. Um, that was the <laughs> hardest time I've ever had with anything in Genshin. <laughs> what? You're, you're telling me that you didn't beat everyone on your first try? Yuck, yuck, yuck. I... I'm so mad you can't rematch Ito. Uh, so if you didn't play it, <laughs> yeah. there is a part in the story beat where you face off against Ito, but you use his deck and his deck is shit garbage and like everything is bad and has no synergy. And he's actually using Shinobu's deck, which is this insane hyper bloom deck that just summons everything and runs itself. I got uh, pretty ignominiously like thrashed and I thought I'd be able to rematch. I was I was not able to. So Ito did kick my ass, and I, that's very embarrassing. But not nearly half as embarrassing as not showing up at all. And that's why we are going to give our final version 3L 
to our beautiful girl, our dumb little cheap cheap Kujo Sara. In everyone's favorite segment, there is no W in tank. Because you miss all the shots you don't take, and many of the ones that you do. But at least take those shots, Sara. She showed up literally to watch her god until she lost and then left. Sara did not roll, did not flex her warrior's skills at the warrior's game. She wasn't even there for security, like she wasn't on duty. She just went to go look at stuff and then didn't even see the tournament all the way through because her, her favorite contestant uh, beefed it. I almost wouldn't have given her the L if she didn't show up and they just said like, oh, Sara's on Tenryo duty. But the fact that she was there in the event just to like be a stick in the mud and not be doing anything. It's like, oh, it's you. You're finally here and you're not even participating. That's how we're going to see you off of Operation 3. God damn it, Sara. I mean, I beat him. Off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I engaged with the system as soon as it came out. I started. I played a bunch of it pretty much until I unlocked Ganyu, but I kind of fell off of it just because I have like a little more experience with like other TCG games like Magic the Gathering. Yeah, you're and, a magic man. And Hearthstone, and you're a card game within the air. So I, I found the system to be a little frustrating at times because some of the problems that you tried to find a solution to from other games didn't really land as like good solutions to me so mm. like kind of the primary one is you know resource management like with magic the gathering it's land they use lands to tap for mana they they limit you in ways to how quickly you can ramp yourself up to the ability to play your big cards and obviously there's exceptions to this because magic is like 30 years old uh with genius invocation they tried to solve that by having dice rolling the problem with that is by having eight different kinds of like mana for yeah. lack of a better word, or energy, I guess, that you can pull up. It makes it really hard to roll into the energy you need. Yeah. Which is Yeah, that was definitely my sense. Sometimes, like, it feels like save scumming, basically. Like, I will brute force my way into a victory just until, like, I roll enough, you know, hydros for Rodia to do her burst. Yeah, that was kind of the, the thing that I walked away with, was that it developed its own kind of internal meta fairly quickly, where... The cards in your hand didn't really matter. They were just the tools to get you the energy you needed in order to burst with your characters or set up the reactions that you need. So like my kind of favored strategy was always to use freeze to lock down an enemy to prevent them from acting freeze and then just so destroy fucked. them. It's, it's so perfect. fucked. It's it's a meta strategy. And that's what I'm saying though. It's like they did not develop a game that was complex enough to allow for alternate strategies to winning. Like you don't have alternate win cons that you can pull by like drawing the right set of cards. It's just the first to get their burst off. And that's not super fun to me. I can understand why people would enjoy it. And I, I appreciate that they were trying to build this game basically mirroring Genshin and its mechanics so that if you play Genshin, you kind of just automatically know how stuff works. Yeah. But yeah, I yeah. think they locked themselves too closely to that association to make a game that stands on its own, which I guess yeah. it's not supposed to, but... Down to a point where the dps's that are op in the game are also op in tcg yeah hey did you know that <laughs> don use frost like arrow and genius invocation hits all opponents you hit all their characters oh that isn't that supposed to like not even be possible by the rules of the game mm -hmm. and it, it applies cryo to all of them meaning if you set up with a rodea hydro or like a kokomi mm. Jeez. Mm. did you know that this Game mode single-handedly made me hate Shang Ling. That's what made you hate Shang Ling. <laughs> Listen. I've never been personally victimized by her as much as when I played Ayaka on hard mm -hmm. in the story. Oh, but I God, have to say, yeah. like, winning felt fucking great. Because we were just like, it was like trading blows. Um, also, this is the first PvP mode that they've introduced to the game. Um, that is true. And that, that in itself is kind of fun, even if it is pretty shallow. Um, I think the most surprising thing to me is that uh, Genius Invocation is not tied into microtransactions at all. Like, the, the original gotcha game, right? The booster pack. They at least had the decency to not do that to us. 
that surprising. Yeah, there's yeah, no yeah. gotcha mechanic with the cards, and you can't buy anything with real money to get the cards. That I I feel for like for now. That's, for now, my guess is they will never charge you to buy cards. My guess is they will charge you to buy like card backs or mm-hmm. like appearance altering like options for cards. Yeah, because uh, it's kind of bullshit. <laughs> I could definitely see that. Next on the docket is transmedia. What is transmedia? That is when you're plugging your IP on many different avenues of media. Obviously, Genshin is a video game, but they are promoting it in different forms in different media as well. One early piece of of Genshin spinoff media that we hadn't talked about yet was uh, the anime. Uh, The Genshin Impact anime project was announced almost like a year ago at this point, honestly. And we got that, you know, beautiful scenery shot. We got Ether and Lumine. It's being produced by UFO Table, and you can really tell the twins kind of look more like uh, Fate Zero's art style than they do their own. And hopefully they'll kind of iron out the art style by the time they actually hit the road. So what are we thinking about this? Like, what shape is this anime project going to take, if anything? Personally, I really hope that it covers the Archon War. That said, it doesn't necessarily need to, but I want what I want it to do is to push the limits of the narrative that can't easily be portrayed in game. It's a different medium. It's not reliant on game assets or needing to stage things or set up camera moves or anything like that. It's really going to be like about showing us like the parts of the lore that otherwise would be a little bit too cost ineffective to put to screen. Yeah. And I'm hoping it fills in some of those blanks. Yeah, I definitely second that. Like, I think that the advantage of, like, using an anime as a medium um, is really that, you know, you can bring more to the table without having to worry about, like, the production of animations. And if it's a retread of, like, the earliest stages of Genshin, which, like, story wise are kind of the weakest, then I think that, you know, unfortunately, that would be a little bit of a missed opportunity. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it needs to. I think it needs to be its own story. I don't think it needs to be a retelling of the game. As as much as that might be, you know, an avenue for someone to get into it that's not really interested in playing the game, I, I think it does more of a service to the fans and the people who would be more likely to engage with it to have a unique story that they're not able to hear from just playing the game. Yeah, they show Aether and Lumine, but I actually really hope that they're only there as like po- like possibly a tiny framing device and that they're otherwise like not featured prominently because I follow them all the time and I'd like to see other stuff. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The stuff that, you know, Genshin's tight release schedule doesn't allow for. Uh, my question is, do we even know if it's going to be a narrative series at all? Like, I'm I'm pretty sure this is not going to be like your 26 it's not going to be like a cur long anime. Um, I see it uh, like a web series, but honestly, I kind of think that it might not even be a narrative package. It might be more experimental or like maybe UFO table is doing animated promos for them here and there, which we've already started to see. Like it, this might just be a partnership between the brands than like an actual Genshin colon the anime. Oh, I was thinking it might be like an anthology where like we kind of get to see more about you know, the lives of the characters that interact with the travelers. But oh, don't. that would be nice. Yeah, yeah, kind of like the um, the Pokemon web series. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, then they, they could just they do, like, do like five like... to ten minute videos that like focus on one character at a time and then just move on. I would kill to see the Archon War. That's mm-hmm. definitely what I'm like the most interested in is stuff, stuff from Tibet's past that isn't really going to be portrayed in the game uh, and, and stuff that would look cooler in full animation than it would in the animatic, like, you know, Raiden fighting Orobashi or, or uh, Rex Lapis fighting Osile. Like, I would love to see Tomo fighting Kujo Sara in front of A and watching him get executed again. <laughs> oh my November. God, that would be awesome. Right? Like an actual you. animated fight? And I know it's going to sound very like adult fan of media for the youth, but I do want a darker tone. I want content that maybe couldn't fly in Genshin either because they've set up this kind of all ages tone or because, you know, the anime is presumably being produced in Japan, which means maybe whatever uh, Chinese media stipulations they have are somewhat loosened. 
I want to see some. Like, I just want to see some blood and some mm-hmm. dis- despair. Fuck blood, death, up. and despair. It's all we want. Fuck them up. But the anime isn't the only transmedia venture they've done, is it? Uh, no, Wander looked into this uh, new web series venture that no one's really talking about and that has weirdly low views for an official Genshin uh, spinoff thing. So, Wander, why don't you tell us what you learned about Astra Carnival? Yeah, hey, all, have you heard of Genshin Impact Astra Carnival? Me either, before like four hours ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it appears to be like a new venture slash like almost network of uh, like live action reality shows that Hoyoverse is doing related to the Genshin Impact IP. Um, but Astro Carnival has done a couple of different things since the beginning of June of this year. Uh, they've had a cooking competition show called Ooh. Astra Carnival World Quest Cookoff. Uh, this premiered on June 5th and was a cooking competition show amongst four different uh, Genshin Impact content creators and streamers who were brought on to cook a, a dish from Genshin Impact and then be judged on it uh, based on, you know, factors like taste, presentation, etc. The meal they made was the Invigorating Kitty Meal. Oh, that's cute. Is, yeah, it's it's just like the little rice ball that looks like a cat and has like eggs and stuff in it. It, it looked delicious. Very cute. Uh, the format of it was really interesting. It was hosted by a uh, Dota commentator who I'd never heard of before named Slax. Oh, wait, Action Sir Action Flax? I had yes. no idea it was Flax. Yeah, Sir so Action Flax. Yeah, he's very well known. Huh. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah, not I'm the <laughs> But yeah, uh, so he, he was the host of it. Uh, the four content creators who were a part of this were named Ariyasaki, BTMC, Bob Master, and Isagril. Uh, and they made a point during the introductions of the uh, contestants that she entered it by submitting like a video entry and then being selected so she won a competition to join the competition and these aren't people doing like remote commentary where they just call in and on a mic no they they showed up on a set like they had a full sound stage for this yeah yo and the uh judges for this were also other genshin impact content creators and streamers uh named atsu antony chen yeah uh, Twanto and Dish. Uh, and so they, they sat in and helped offer the judging for it. Uh, they... those, are, those are a couple names that we see sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I, know, who... uh, I know friend of the show, uh, Windflower Leah on Twitter, uh, did commentary for one of the live action TCG tournaments. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. So, so they have all these extended things. There was also a music competition that they did. <gasps> they have a, what I can only describe as like a real world road rules like challenge show <laughs> where they have like a series of games that the contestants play in yeah and so you can find that on the channels it seems to be called genshin impact astro carnival and if you haven't heard of this don't worry neither has literally anyone else and they are not promoting it anywhere if you look at the astro carnival official twitter this is an official hoyoverse twitter account it has 6k followers as opposed to official Genshin Impact's, you know, 5 million. And the YouTube page has a slightly better 48.4k subs. But the main Genshin Impact YouTube page has over 6.8 million. They're doing all this stuff, but they're burying it. Why? Is this a soft launch kind of a thing? Well, that's the interesting thing, is that all of these seem to be, like, content and streamer run. So I'm wondering how much Hoyoverse is, like, putting the onus of promoting these on them. Being like, oh. draw in your audience, oh. draw in your followers. Huh. That's because yeah, that... it, it might just be a drop in the bucket for them, and then yeah. they're like, "And but we're not gonna like put our marketing behind it. You guys are the marketing, maybe." Yeah, this could be an experiment to see like how well content creators can be good promoters. They've also had some pop up events. They're they're really they're hitting like the convention circuit or some of the more kind of pop culture oriented like art galleries and really trying to do more like touring uh, exhibits of concept art, but also like weird little 3D installations and photo ops and, and standees, uh, which you take a picture with. Cause if there's anything I want to do, it's take a picture with a cardboard cutout of pre-rendered character art that I have seen for a million hours. 
Listen, I'm just salty because they very rarely travel to Cherlifornia. They seem to think New York is sufficient for America, which, remember, is Conria backwards. Um, come over here to the best coast. Come on. Let's get a Genshin Impact beach party going. Come on. Let's go to the beach. Let's go fish blasting and make fish tacos. Yeah, baby. <laughs> In order to do our wrap up of Genshin version 3 and Sumeru, we decided to do it in a report card format. Split into what was most improved and what needs the most improvement. One thing we are not going to talk about is the cultural representation. We already went over the positive and negatives of Sumeru's cultural rep in our previous episode with Amir, known on Twitter as Boram76, and we'll be going even further in depth into it in the spin off series. The Shade Chamber presents Sumeru 101 with Amir, the real cultures behind Genshin's most diverse region. As we said in the previous episode, we will be releasing these over our season break with minimal editing and maximum culture. So aside from the cultural rep, let's get into some of the most improved stuff. I think the one that stood out to us immediately was the writing. They keep getting better at writing. This was a really big jump. Like, this was maybe the biggest jump in-game. Inazuma was already improving, but between Inazuma and Sumeru, like, the the amount I was personally compelled by the stories uh, was very, very boosted. Yeah. Not only from the Archon quest, but also the character story quests. I think we agree across the board. Alhatham's story quest and Yoimiya's second story quest are the best written in the game so far. They were fun. They were poignant. They got the character across without just making him like a bland goody two shoes. <coughs> yeah. And a lot of them sort of reinforced the uh, themes of um, the broader region as well as the Archon quest. A lot of the Fumaru character quests really just kind of continue to uh, build out Fumaru as this kind of like, fantasy cyberpunk setting yeah and the fact that they jumped into cyberpunk as a setting genre here was really unexpected and frankly a little experimental for their little uh fantasy game that they had going here which up till this point had been very like rooted in that fantasy aesthetic so i'm glad that we saw that and it seems like we're kind of jumping into you know more of that genre experimentation with fontaine the sort of like mad scientist college town cyberpunk setting really laid the groundwork for some fun stories. And one of the things that really worked for me in Sumeru was the minor villains. We had some great just like villain of the episode type people, um, you know, students with ambitious and unethical experiments. The hologram dude in Nahida's first character quest uh, that was in that whole hologram city. There was the hive mind guy in Alhatham's character quest who was defeated by Alhatham convincing everyone that there was no reason they couldn't do a better job. And they were like, yeah, fuck this guy. I'm out. It was nice to have villains that didn't relate back to the Fatui, back to the Abyss order, uh, but just like people whose, you know, modest plans of only taking over the countries and not just the entire world. One of the other things that they did a good job with is setting stakes to the story. Because up to this point, like, the stakes have always been kind of vague. Yeah. Like, even even with the Inazuma storyline, it was just like, well, okay, there's a war going on. But we never, we only had, like, one instance where we really saw the consequences of that war, and that was losing our little buddy. Gone but not forgotten. Yeah, um, and, and then, like, afterwards, now that the Vision Hunt decree is repealed, there's all this other injustice, but we are just going to happily go into the ceasefire. And, you know, I, it's okay if the war's on hold, because we know it's just on hold, but kind of the, a healthy resentment and the impact of it doesn't seem to have affected any of the characters involved, which is weird. Yeah, wh yeah. whereas with the storytelling in Sumeru, we do still see the problems exist post-academia, and a lot of the character quests that came out after that point kind of pick up and, and show us that. And even just, like, like going back to minor villains, like, the even more minor villains in, like, Alhatham's story quest were the students who pressured another student to commit suicide. Like, yeah. that is not a subject that they shied away from in that story. It was heartbreaking. It was. It was rough. Yeah, and then, like, while it's, it's 
a lot better on a micro scale. On a macro scale, we, we're also dealing with, like, damage rot in Fumaru that, like, from events in, like, the deep past, which still kind of scar the land. More or less everything involving Golden Slumber, uh, the mystery surrounding, like, what happened to King Deshret. And the standing, like, racial trauma um, between the Eremites and the people of the Rainforest. Like, Golden Slumber... Listen, it wasn't perfect, but I really enjoyed it because that was some writer taking NPCs and saying, like, I need to write something to fill in time for this game, and I can't use playable characters. But I'm going to see that as an opportunity to tell a no-holds-barred story with a lot more nuance and kind of difficult stuff and a longer leash than if I was writing for playable characters. And I'm going to take these OCs basically and make them my own and tell a story. That was great. And still and still managed to tie them back into all the themes of the region that we don't that we just went over basically. Like it did touch on the racial injustice that the Aramites have been dealing with. It did deal with the cyberpunk like technological wonders of King Deshret's era. Like it it managed to hit all of those points so well that like it was kind of amazing that the world quest yeah and it became a a story of a father and his daughter yeah and like it effectively communicated stakes in a way that was a lot more pressing in a lot of instances than previous world quests Mm -hmm. like in in azuma for example we have the tatarasuna and really fixing that but beyond kind of fixing an already known problem the characters seem to be more content to kind of just let it languish than um, more or less dealing with like an extremist faction who are attempting to create another hive mind. The stories were more personal. They revolve more around people. We always say that like Golden Slumber felt like Star Trek. It, it even had like the, the trope of the snooty academics, you know, scientist on an away mission with uh, like a more salt of the earth, actual like knowledgeable local who doesn't have the book smarts, but is clearly the wiser. And the traveler is just like a Starfleet guy kind of overseeing <laughs> this exchange of ideas. And uh, just like Star Trek, it kind of goes for a third answer cop out when these two ideologies clash. But uh, hey, that's better than most of the shit they wrote for us in Mondstadt and Liyue. So I will take it. So we're going to compliment sandwich this with one of the needs improvement things and that is the world quest fatigue because i don't know if you guys noticed the rnr quest is a it's a little long did you guys get that impression i did get that impression once it fractaled into its fourth tangent quest Mm -hmm. and then it fractaled again and then it fractaled again then it fractaled again some people still say that they have never escaped or ended the r quest. It's still just going in their quest log. It's yeah, yeah. Some forever. say it's still fractaling till this very day. The r quest was absolutely monstrous. It overstayed its welcome. It overstayed its charm. Rana was in that bubble for like seven months for me. It wasn't fun and interesting enough to get back into it when I had taken a break from it. And the other alternative was to do what Wander did, marathon it, and hate yourself. Yes. Uh, I mean, but the, the thing, too, is that, like, I think on some level this was probably recognized just because every subsequent world quest, like, while still fairly extensive, was a great deal shorter than the r r one. Yeah. But woof. Uh, back to the positive. Someone take us back into the second positive. Uh, enemy and NPC design was much better in Sumeru. Like, we have very distinct characters that we can make out that are still following, like, NPC designs, like Dunyarzad. Uh, we had, I mean, the Aramites, who I think everyone was really thirsty for when they came out, and rightfully so. And I still am today. Hey, yo, alligator man, call me. Yeah, all, all of the animal stand users. Oh, the animal stand users were so sick. That is such a cool, like, low health mechanic change. Is they summon a whole Pokemon. Very cool critters all across uh, the Samir Rainforest. Uh, shout out to our cousins, the CrossFit Hilly Turtles that are found in the Riddle of the Sand. They're fit fluencers, and they can be kind of obnoxious, but they're, they're good guys. They mean well. We buy them whey protein sometimes when it's their birthdays. We're definitely not jealous of how yoked they am at all. Couldn't be us. Could never be me. Oh. As always, the new environments are just absolutely stellar as well. Um, oh my god, the domains, like, the domains in Sumeru are so beautiful, and they're not, like, 
clear grid tile sets the way every other domain is. So it's just these big, like, dream-like flowers. So cool. Uh, they also snuck a second domain tile set in, which you only would have seen if you played Windbloom, and that is the Mondstadt Interior Mondstadt Library uh, tile oh, set. Oh, yeah. That was a lot of work. Hopefully we'll see some more interior Mondstadt domains. They're really getting the characters and the camera to act and add more more emphasis and excitement, and that's great. The most exciting bit of like cutscene stagecraft that they did was... A pep the thing everyone loves about this game's cutscenes are the 2D animatics. And I just thought using that technology to put a pep in the 3D world was so well done. And it was such an economically like feasible uh, solution. Yeah. It's just the giant cardboard cutout dragon. But you know what? Like putting him in the world, it was good. It was a good idea. Uh, he was very intimidating. And it was a really, really low tech solution to the problem of making a giant, you know, country sized dragon. Sometimes with the turnaround that they have, these problems do require low tech solutions. And I think what we got was better looking and more impressive than if they like tried to bang out a whole like a pep model. Getting a pep in game using this low tech solution gives Mihoyo time to design a pep either for the anime or as a 3D model while simultaneously having their cake and eating it by allowing a pep to you know speak on screen and have this narrative presence. You know what I just remembered was something they started doing this version are the cut-ins. So they started doing this with the uh, school festival event. These mid-quest character static shots using the same philosophy as the hangout quest ending pictures where it's using better models and probably painting over them and creating a more like emotive and expressive image than you could if you were just using the in-game assets. You know, like when poor Tehnari was suffering in the heat. You could just do the like womp womp sad <laughs> canned animation, but seeing him in a in a pose he couldn't do easily with the rig he had, uh, displaying an emotion that he couldn't really do with the character model, like that worked a lot better than like trying to add that to the 3D anime. That was a really economic and very, I think, successful uh, solution to the fact that their game models are kind of stiff and kind of ugly. <laughs> and speaking of stiff and ugly. <laughs> those Jeez. those limited events <laughs> no notes on the story portions of the events they were great everyone loved the yokai event everyone loved the school festival event where nahida makes scaramouche go to school fantastic we, we love hat guy there wasn't yes. a lot of standout limited event gameplay maybe it's because we have all been chasing the specter of shiki taisho ever since that blew our socks off in a uh, version two but most of the stuff felt like retreads of old game modes or stuff that was kind of unambitious like the more arcadey mini games like yokai uh, ping pong breakout and the half-assed pac-man clone that they gave us at windbloom <laughs> most of the events that they ran were also just your typical blue door combat domain exactly of course i had some original elements but it was still kind of not necessarily pushing the envelope in the same way we've seen them do for certain gameplay oriented events in the past. It felt more like dabbling instead of like a dedicated push into a new gameplay mode. You can tell how confident they are in an event mechanic by how generously they give out rewards. Mm -hmm. I think one of the worst ones was the Adventurer's Trials, which is something that we kind of been hoping for, which is these Mario Party style mini games. You could tell they had zero confidence in those game modes, though, because they rewarded you based on the number of times you played. It wasn't score or proficiency based. It was like, did you do these? OK, you get the top shelf price. Every event minigame with a half-baked mechanic is a dry run for an event that they're going to roll out later. That was the most obvious with the camera-based combat events, which were just a beta test for Nahida's skill. So it is always fun to see, even if this game mode isn't good, what might it lead to later. But none of these really led to anything. The, the most impressive new game mode was definitely the Fungus Pokemon event. That was like actually you commanding on screen like AI driven companions. Although we did see some of the new world quests and areas add new gameplay mechanics that were different. And this of course involved sort of the Ari, which uh involved you kind of getting a little flying dude who go around and blast things. 
eventually. That is definitely a dry run for doing stuff with the Celia and Fontaine. I'm going to look really stupid if I'm wrong. Uh, one thing we really missed that they had more of in version two was limited event bosses. It's been a long time since they did anything like Beisht or the actually fightable Oceanid instead of fighting her little animals. I really thought that's what the Wenute event was going to be. Like, I was hoping for some Monster Hunter style, like you're gliding around on the sand and you have to shoot it with like a harpoon and yank it to the surface and beat the shit out of it. It was just, no, they were just a hazard for a pretty standard like treasure hunting slash combat based event. Yeah, it kind of devolved into just like leyline monolith defense at a uh, certain point. Yeah, this time with uh, Shai Hulud. Mm -hmm. So what was your favorite mediocre event gameplay? I genuinely liked the beetle fighting. I thought it was pretty fun. The beetle that fighting was sincerely challenging at points. Yeah. Too. Um, I'm, I don't know why, because I actually don't even like the Mario Maker style events, but I was very enamored by the teapot puzzle kind of building that was Shahrivar's contribution to the Academia School Festival. Uh, I think it's just because I'm a teapot main, so I'm biased towards seeing my friends, the teapot furniture in any setting and trying to play golf with how many pieces you placed was actually kind of fun. Uh, the right level of challenge was definitely that lantern right paper puzzle platformer. Yeah. Um, it oh was kind of the most like unique thing uh, I really remember from the last year as far as mini games go. And it was tough, but it was fair. I appreciate their ability to still take risks with the difficulty levels on stuff that would require just a little bit more dev time. Yeah, we will say nothing about the absolute dog shit rendition that we got in the summer event. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the paper uh, sort of lantern stories were definitely my favorite. Upon recollection, those were the ones where I think I felt the like highest level of satisfaction with actually resolving them relative yeah. to the amount of time it like took to put it into them yeah they did good on those this just in we just had a breaking announcement as i was editing this very podcast in fact my mic that i usually use for recording just died and now i have to use my headset mic to tell you that we got a daily double that's right kujo sara took another l in version three right as we were about to leave Girl just out here losing all the time, huh? She really thought she could sneak it past us, but as I was editing the B-roll looking for past event gameplay, I was like, oh, that's right. And that's a big one. Bigger than the TCG one and far more embarrassing. Wander, why don't you spill the tea? So in the Warrior Spirit event, which was like the little fighting tournament event that uh, Ayaka was chosen as the Archon's emissary for, uh... Sara kind of only showed up at the end because Raiden A told her, "Hey, you gotta get, you gotta get good, scrub. Like, go, go see how a real warrior fights." Only to go watch Ayaka just whip some ass. Kujo Sara, the Shogun's own champion, the 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 formidable figure we saw wielding a sword in the preview for Inazuma animatic, uh, not only got passed over for the princess to be her Archon's emissary in the sword fighting tournament, but was then told to watch the proceedings to learn something. She is in remedial sword classes, everybody. That is how dire it has become for the terrible Tengu. Also, the first listener who can tell us accurately how many L's Sara has taken up to this point in the podcast, counting every single one that we rapid fire in the retelling of her backstory in the original episode of There's No W in Tengu, will get a shout out the next time we bring this segment back. Which could be any moment now. <laughs> Hopefully not before I get a replacement mic. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, and the way the way this bird takes L's, like I, I speed that up a little bit. Yeah, L for Logitech, like my mic that broke. Anyway, back to the podcast. What they also did good on is arguably their most needed improvement, and that was fixing the new player experience, lowering the barrier to entry. Yes, uh, absolutely. We talked a bit in a previous episode about the Yai problem. And the Yai problem is that if you're a new player, you come in and you roll Yai on the banner. You are not fucking using her for a while, buddy. Yai requires hand guards to ascend even once. And Inazuma is story locked. So you have to blow through the entire 
Bonstadt and Liyue stories to even ascend her once. Then you have to finish the Inazuma Archon quest and complete several unintuitively linked successive world quests to open up Enkanomiya and then do the entire Enkanomiya world quest to fight the two Vishap bosses to ascend her past Ascension 1. I've heard if you don't really know about Enkonomiya, it's really hard to find Enkonomiya. Yeah. It's very, very buried in the game at this point. We who played it as it came out take for granted that they had a banner reminding you that there were these two new Vishap bosses. But the follower of the show told us that they came in later than that and they had no fucking clue that those bosses existed. And they got Mm -hmm. current with everything else. That is the worst direction you could ever give your players. It just works against them too because... People are going to get frustrated if they can't play with the toys they got in a timely manner. Exactly. Like, this is a gotcha game. You are selling the characters. And so if you if you have someone who buys a character and they can't use them or play with them like they want to, then what the fuck was the point of them playing your game or spending money? So the main thing about that is all the world bosses in Sumeru are accessible, like, by walking. You can ostensibly get through the game's opening cutscene, wake up on the beach, walk to Sumeru, and fight the Dendro Hypostasis. Like, yeah, it's a lot of walking, but it beats doing a bunch of quest lines. And we already know that they're carrying that through to Fontaine, because they said in the version preview that there will be a teleport waypoint uh, that appears right next to the entrance to Fontaine as soon as you start the game for new players. Like, you don't even have to walk anymore. You can... It's when you beat the Mondstadt Archon quest, which is still, like early enough thank god so when as a new player you just do that and then you can get straight to fontaine and farm materials for new viet or whoever another thing they did is they eased quest prereqs for events they gave you a like bypass option where it's like okay you might not have done the quests that put these characters where they're are intended to be at the point of this event but you can just say just pretend that i did them and you can access the events and that's good. That definitely like eases things up a bit on newer players. The last uncomplimentary end of the compliment sandwich is Endgame still sucks. No excuse for this one. We have simulated universe over in Star Rail. It's basically the Shiki Taisho event. They figured out how to integrate it into the game. They really ought to just figure something out. Now, like the problem with Spiral is that Spiral is prohibitive to new players. But what better thing to add than something like a roguelite in that case where, you know, like luck can make up for, you know, unbuilt characters or, you know, skill issues. Um, Yeah, they they just have to have something else because the thing about it is that it's like spirals just not fun enough and it doesn't need to necessarily be anything that that requires like tons and tons of extra systems. But honestly, some kind of like second meta track would be a welcome addition to the game at this point. Well, and one of the things that they did with the simulated universe that they could even carry over just to, if they insist on keeping, you know, spiral is just have multiple difficulty modes that you can choose. Like each simulated universe world that you can enter has like multiple difficulty tracks with like easier ones giving like less rare rewards and harder ones giving you harder to get rewards. Yeah. And they already make that kind of sort of like tierage within events. And, like, with the knowledge that they do that in events and other properties like Honkai Star Rail have better versions of that end game, they sh- I would say they should know better, but they already knew- do know better. Yeah. So, suffice to say, some good, some bad, all of it invalidated because you cannot put the tortoises from the Desert of Hadramaveth in your teapot, and that makes this game shit garbage. Uninstall Genshin. Zero out of ten. Awful four point oh is upon us. Good God, it feels like it's only been two months. A lot of stuff in that trailer, and honestly, I am feeling it. The excitement for Fontaine that the devs have is just so palpable, and they're going back and they're shoring up a lot of stuff in just the overall Genshin experience as well. In fact, two of the upcoming additions to the game invalidate two of our negative report card topics. The first one being the kind of milk toast gameplay in the limited event. That's because on the stream, they literally said, we put all our manpower and our resources into the underwater game mechanics. And I believe it. And that was desperately needed because 
No one has done good prolonged underwater exploration movement fighting in a Zelda S game. Underwater gameplay is a meme. No one likes it. Yeah, it's nope. it's terrible. It's overall they like... need all the help they can get. Now, yeah. one of my favorite games of all time is Abzu. They definitely played Abzu and looked at that as a reference. But Abzu is a journey like it's a game that's more about moving and vibing than it is about getting quests done. It's the antithesis of what you want to do when you're going through Genshin. And so having this gorgeous Abzu like movement would would be a lot more frustrating in the context of a Zelda like game like Genshin. Is it going to be fun? It seems like the devs themselves don't really know because, boy, they spent a lot of time in that preview reiterating this takes a lot of work. This is not easy to do. No one has done this well. We are trying our best and we we threw all of our resources at it. What that doesn't say to me is we think this is fantastic and you're going to love it. (laughs) Yeah, it was it was a kind of sussy presentation just in the amount of time that they use to explain it face to face yeah not because i don't believe in the earnestness of their efforts but they've been cagey about details of development on just about everything else so it's a bit weird that they would pop out and explain for this length of time like just how much work went into the underwater combat like it's Kind of seems like it's doing damage control. Um, I'm cynical because underwater combat is universally terrible. Everyone tries it. It's always a question of whether they... No one bothers to ask whether they should, only if they could. And the could is always sort of a half measure. So we'll see if this is good or not. Hopefully it is. (laughs) Hopefully this is going to be the best underwater combat ever. But I'm holding my breath. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. They at least seem to be taking the obvious into consideration in terms of holding your breath, wherein there is no oxygen meter. So they at least know that that sucks. Yeah, holding your breath is different if you're playing like a Zelda game where you're not actually going in the water. The water is an obstacle. The water Mm -hmm. is an obstacle in Banjo Kazooie in Mario. This, they want you to have the same like free exploration as you have in Genshin's overworld. And so it, it makes perfect sense to take out the oxygen meter. That's the opposite of prolonged exploration. It remains to be seen whether their kind of lackluster controller feel is just absolute shit in the underwater sections. Anyway, the other complaint we had that was immediately refuted by the trailer was the confirmation of that early game waypoint into Fontaine, which retroactively justifies the incredible plotting length of the R&R quest. Because... That told us the r r quest is not for us. It is for new players. So they have confirmed by adding that waypoint that they now intend for new players to visit these regions out of order with the story. Uh, you may not know this, but this game started off as heavily inspired by Breath of the Wild, which is famously a game where you can complete stages of the story out of order. Now, Genshin ended up telling a more complicated story, and it did need everything to function as a whole unit, but they still want you to visit these regions early, and that means you need something to do. So the r and request is supposed to last a player from early game access to Sumeru all the way to the actual Sumeru Archon quest. It is that long for a reason. I still think it's too long, but we can see now that... Every region in the mainland, because Inazuma's story locked anyway, but every mainland region is probably going to have this tentpole long-form world quest from now on. Hopefully, we as longtime players will be able to recognize them and not feel pressured to beat them in one patch, because woof. So there's still a lot on the table as far as possibilities of what we'll see in version 4 and Fontaine. And we decided, hey... There's five of us, Charles, and there's five letters in bingo. So we have gone and made for you the official Shade Chamber Fontaine bingo card. Each of us picked a row of things we think we will or hope we will see in Fontaine, and we are now going to go down our row and present them, starting with that oh-so-striking purple churl on the left. So, first item, item B, what I want to see in Fontaine. I want a scene where the traveler crashes a fancy soiree. I love that beat in stories. It is always fun when the player party goes to some fancy schmancy rich people 
shindig and just like makes a mess of it. Bioware knows this really well. Some of my favorite versions of that trope are the Citadel DLC in Mass Effect 3 and the scene in Dragon Age Inquisition where you just make a mess of the Orlesian Gala, which Orle is, of course, Dragon Age's fictional fantasy France. I want some shenanigans at a fancy ball. I want Paimon to fly blind and crash into a champagne tower. I want poodles to run amok. I, I just want it to get goofy and crazy. Item number I for Eiffel. I really became enamored with the idea that the celestial nail in Fontaine is trussed up to look like the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Fontaine are fanatics for judgment and see themselves as living like with the divine's favor and having overcome some like more sinful version of themselves long ago. And so I came up with this idea of like the nail that Celestia sent down in punishment, they would turn into this kind of monument. And now they're like, you know, thank the stars every day that that judgment turned us into the paragons of justice that we are today. I don't think we're going to get it, but if they if I do, I'll be so happy. Number N. I want the ancient civilization of Fontaine to be Celtic. I want it so bad. <laughs> um so far we've had, you know, the 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 Norse civilization of Mondstadt. Liwe is just old enough to be its own ancient civilization. Ankanomia brings the Greek stuff to Inazuma, Sumeru's got the Egyptian stuff. The Celts do have a, a cultural cross history with France via the Gauls, via the Bretons. Uh, I, I think it is absolutely a perfect chance to put in Celtic mythology. And we know they're into it because we do have Seely and the Loch folk, which are directly from Celtic traditions. And also, we know these people have played fate and they know what a Kuhulan is. My item for G is a follow-up on the Umibozu. This is something they introduced in Inazuma and dropped like a hot potato. I think this is the perfect time, though, to come back to them. We know very little about the Umibozu. They were alluded to by a Sumeru scholar in his notes on Yashiori as some kind of, like, lurking eldritch horror. But then we know one befriended that lesbian on Watatsumi Island. Uh, and left skeletal remains that are, like basically evoke a giant mermaid. And there's m mention of sea monsters attacking um, Port Ormos. So it's like, let's see some scary giant merfolk. Last but not least, my O bingo item is a bayou sub area. This would add just, just kind of more cultural texture to the landscape of Fontaine. Uh, we already know that there are more cultures in it than just French. Um, Navia is shown to have an Italian title, which could even imply like Corsica DLC coming soon. But I think that just like the French language bayou with, with the music, with the environment, with the alligators would be a very cool and unexpected addition to the Fontenoy landscape. Because swamps are cool and aesthetic. And Hoyoverse, you get extra points if you put people of color in it, because goddamn, we are not letting you off the hook for that shit. So for my B card, uh, I have, and I'm Javert on there. And I'm Javert. But just honestly, like one psychotic police officer who's after you for pretty banal reasons. Uh, it might be those little slug guys. Uh, it might be a rollable character. It might be some combination of the two. Not sure yet. For I. Uh, an organization devoted to protecting the legal language. This is mostly a snipe at l'Académie Française, but given that this is a legal setting, uh, it could be some kind of letter of the law BS. Um, so as, as an example of the kind of bonkers efforts of l'Académie Française, what is the now mandated a legal government language term for streaming in France? Oh, so what they say um, is... Joueur animateur en direct, which is, of course, direct gamer animator. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, one of the quotes I'm seeing in this article is, I'm French and I find this absolutely ridiculous. No one will ever use those terms. 
Onto my N section, a Roman influence subregion. It's no secret that Rome had a decent amount of influence on early France, and there are still all manner of coliseums and aqueducts strewn about the country, especially in the south of France. And I think it's a shame not to lean into that. Nice. I mean, nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Section G, Japonisme. There is a history of importing Japanese goods to France. In this era that Fontaine portrays, they were importing, like, Japanese prints, Japanese art. The French bande dessinée and manga industry is booming. Mihoyo loves Japan. Mihoyo's making a country about France. And there's plenty of fun otaku-related cross-border shenanigans our favorite characters can get into i also hope we have the opposite effect and get paris syndrome ayaka who goes to the fontaine that she read about in her light novels and is just utterly disappointed at what it actually is all right and section o a luke alcohol inspired fight there is a folk monster, the Lucarcol, in France. It is essentially a snail dragon, and it looks pretty badass. It feels like it's underutilized in mythology, but Mihoyo is known for going for the deep cuts when it suits them. And I think this would be a great type of boss fight. And that is my bingo. All right, well, that sounds like it's my turn. So, for my uh, B in bingo, um, I'd like to touch upon, like, a... A uh, subplot that's frequent in a lot of games involving France, or England for that matter, in a Masquerade Ball subplot. This is a, a uh, subplot that shows up in a lot of games I like, such as like Dishonored or uh, Dragon Age. And it's always a lot of fun uh, in terms of getting a lot of like plot-important characters in one place in a sort of high-stakes uh, social drama situation. Um, I'd really love to see that in Fontaine. For my eye in bingo, I would like to put forth the inevitability of a Phoenix Wright reference. We know that Mihoyo is a bunch of huge nerds, and the likelihood of there being a Phoenix Wright reference in there somewhere, uh, whether it's someone slamming the table or pointing at someone dramatically, seems, well, frankly, like an inevitability. It would be literally a shame to not include a nod to the most famous and beloved lawyer in video games, at least until the Better Call Saul dating sim comes out. Yeah, exactly. As you know, I will be romancing Chuck in my playthrough of that, so look forward to that on my Twitch. <laughs> um, for our free space, the center N in bingo, uh, we would like to, of course, remind everyone that uh, while there are characters who are playable who might seem unreliable, they're actually a really cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have uh, a negative impression of a character and then have a better impression of them and paimon is gonna spell it out yep um for g one of the previews shown um actually demonstrated that some of the new uh animals introduced will be through these poodles they all have little different outfits and uh different colors so we're all hoping that there's some kind of limited event based on poodle styling <laughs> That would be just amazing. <laughs> and lastly, the Panopticon as sort of like a building form, which is um, a prison that is sort of uh, circular, uh, relying heavily on ideas of sort of surveilling of prisoners, um, was kind of a form that um, not only kind of slots very easily into any kind of Roman-inspired area, but was also kind of uh, discussed a lot by French philosophers. Um so given that it's a nation of justice, imprisonment, surveillance, um, I would be very surprised if we didn't see some kind of Panopticon-inspired area, uh, which is, of course, why it's my O in bingo. Obviously, Rad's not here. They're still respawning, but they've given us the blessing to go ahead and read their bingo row. So starting with B, or should I say Bree... Uh, Rad says, a list of French cheeses, including cheeses not made in France. I don't know if that's in the context of, like, uh, the game's devs not doing research or some guy in the game trying to look like he knows stuff about French cheese when he's really eating, like, you know, uh, Parmigiano Reggiano and he looks like an asshole. Is, yeah, yeah. Is Gruyere French? It's like Swiss, right? It's like very... I believe it is. I, I could be wrong. I'll, I'll have to check the list of uh, cheeses that the very real uh, Swiss cheese cartel allowed to exist. 
I'm sure it's a very divisive lore subject, so we'll we'll move on. All right, the uh, next item that Rad added to their eye of the bingo card is that Venti shows up summoned by enough day drinkers in a small enough area, which I think makes sense. Um, Manifest. We don't know how the Fontenois um, relate to Mondstadt's drinking culture, but you can bet if anyone's going to be there to capitalize on it, it's going to be Venti. It's almost an inevitability at this point. He's going to show up at, you know, the Fonch Starbucks where they sell wine and then order a, a Venti wine. I mean, of course he'll show up in Fontaine. He's basically the green fairy. <laughs> hey, uh, the next item that Rad put on as their N was uh, the note that all the Fontenois complain about how ugly the Eiffel Tower is, um, which I think makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the Eiffel Tower, far from its uh, current status as one of France's most uh, iconic landmarks, was initially quite div- divisive. Fair enough. Moving on to their G slot here, we have the Fontenois have motor vehicles and also Parisian traffic, no. including French cussing. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> as a, you know, as a resident of Los Angeles, I, I definitely can get behind some traffic cussing. <laughs> Absolutely. The boat traffic, the taxi traffic. The poodle traffic. The sewer traffic. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, no. The, all the Orbeez <laughs> in the sewers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> clogging up the pipes. I would love to learn some, some uh, practical French vocab from this game. By that, of we course, can... I mean cusses. We can only hope. <laughs> and then finally, we move on to uh, what they have in the O box, which actually brings us to our very first bingo point. Uh, the appearance and possible use of a guillotine which, uh, as we saw in the preview trailer, is actually the Fontaine Research Institute. It's the Fontaine Research Institute of Kinetic Energy Engineering. I know because it spells freaky. Oh, that's clever. But yeah, we, uh-huh. we have seen a Eiffel Tower-sized guillotine that is set up as a couple of towers as a part of the Research Institute. So we do know that there's a guillotine. Now, the question is, are we going to get to see it cut off in Umibozu's head? Amazing. I'm of the opinion that it's been used since the uh, Institute is called the former Institute and it's in ruins. This plot line reeks of Les Mis. Obviously, there isn't an uprising yet, but the class disparity, the literal white and black halves of the city of like its splendor and then it's like poverty sprawl. Like they're they're right there. And even though there seems to be no rebellion going on, I think Traveler is going to end up starting one. But anyway, I kept thinking of the of the lyrics from Les Mis that go, there was a time we killed the king. We tried to change the world too fast. Now we have got another king. He is no better than the last. So my headcanon is that the Institute was used to kill the previous Archon. That would be sick. And that's what caused it to explode. Just Archon energy. Oh, yeah, it'd be like uh, what happened to the um, Goddess of Salt all over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like maybe Celestia mandated they be tried and killed by their own people. Maybe the people really did rise up and overthrow the old Archon. I'm definitely interested in seeing how this region interfaces with essentially the thematic words that were in the, like, Tevat trailer, where they were talking about, like, how, like, even the Hydro Archon knows better than the stand in judgment of the gods. Exactly. The flavor text for the Hydro gem, as well as that teaser trailer, like, it it, it kind of feels like the Archon feels pretty, like, she's in a precarious position at any given moment. She's like, they can even judge me. That was my reasoning. It's like, she says that because that's happened in the past. The idea that someone could be in judgment of her interfacing with the kind of, like, prophecy that was foreshadowed in the uh, more, more recent Fontaine trailer... I think it's definitely something that I'm looking forward to. Yes. All right. Who, me? Couldn't be. Anyway. Yes, uh, <laughs> for For my B slot, I put B for biting. Because I think we're going to get some vampire lore in this one. <laughs> Cause, yeah. and so in the, in the preview event, they mentioned that Fontaine is kind of meant to embody mostly France, but also kind of the rest of Europe that wasn't covered by Mondstadt previously. So I think we can get some really cool, like, Eastern European lore in there, specifically vampires, because as the country of water, 
What's more terrifying than a being that drains water out of you and leaves you a desiccated husk? Or a being that can't cross running water. So either Fontaine is either going to be lousy with vampires or it is going to be the most vampire-free nation on Tavat. They they huddled them all into an island and left them there. They hate it. They, they hate, hate it. it there. They're going to be so pissed, but when that Halloween event comes around, they're going to be waiting for you. Uh, for my eye slot, I put uh, kind of a more specific Phoenix Wright uh, reference that I think is coming. I think specifically we are going to get an instance of Yanfei shouting, objection. It has to happen. She's like our lawyer character. And not just the objection that she says when she's at half health. Yes, exactly. We, we in a court setting. Like, we might even see a little, like, text pop up. I, I doubt they'd go that far, but we'll see. But Wander, that means they would have to write something interesting for Yanfei to do, and they can't have that. I mean, it's only been 84 years. They'll have to do it eventually. <laughs> uh, going on to my end slot. Uh, we've already had the Iridescence tour appear at least once in Lantern Rite. And so what could their next musical event be? Why, well, Eurovision, of course. They need Whoa. to bring the countries together. We need our representatives. There's at least like one musical person in every country. At least one. Yeah. And, and there's like a bunch you could pick from in Mondstadt. So have them come together for a musical competition in Fontaine based on France, one of the founding countries of Eurovision, and let them all compete. And find out which talented little Genshin playable character is going to get the deux points. My guess is none of them. They'll, they'll have some weird outwork. It's like attacked by the Fatui or something. Wait, so you're saying they're all going to get nul points? They'll all get nul points. Not nul points. No one gets nul points. Except the UK. Except the UK and Germany and Spain <laughs> and... Anyway, I, I can't wait for the part where Mondstadt intentionally botches their entry because they can't afford to host it. But like Venti sings so good, he might win anyway. And everyone's like, we need to kill him. <laughs> they, they can't reappropriate their gene heart medication budget. They just can't. <laughs> uh, moving on to my G slot. I put baguette event weapon. Because you know it's coming. We already have a fucking swordfish. There's no way we're not getting a baguette claymore. Basically, if this doesn't happen, we know that these people are hacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, for Bingo was his name oh, a World's Fair area slash event. I mean, one of the most famous like World's Fair of all was the 1889 Paris World's Fair. It saw the unveiling of the Eiffel Tower. It saw just so many you know innovations being displayed at the time we're already going to fontaine a country of technological marvel within uh to that it, it just makes sense that they're going to have an area to show off a lot of that technology to show off kind of what everyday life is and could be in fontaine and maybe to unveil some fucked up mechanical work i don't know absolutely that would be a great chance to have the world leader summit that we are all just drooling for as well <laughs> Like people yeah, admiring yeah. these goofy little installations of each other's culture. It would also be a great excuse to reuse a lot of the set pieces they introduced during the summer event. Exactly. Oh, good point. And yeah, if they for it. and if they feel like they need to diversify the enemies a little bit more in some of the earlier areas, now that they're trying to like make it all more early player uh, accessible, they could just throw some of the mechanical guard enemies from Fontaine into like Mondstadt and be like, "We imported these because the." Knights of Avonius can't do this shit on their own. We got some Robocops. They're real fucked up. They're real fucked up. But yeah, that is that is our bingo card for Fontaine. Let us know if you had, you know, your own ideas that you'd like to throw onto your own bingo card in the comments. Yeah. What crackpot ideas do you have for Fontaine? Did Sandrone make Fremine? Will the Phantom of the Opera appear? Is this all somehow A's fault? The answer is yes, maybe yes. <laughs> yeah. We'd love to hear what you want out of what is probably going to be the wackiest region of Genshin. Also, we didn't say this, but God, there has to be a mime somewhere in Fontaine, right? There is a mime. mime. It's called the Traveler. Somewhere. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. So, as I probably did a shit job explaining... This is our season finale. We will not reappear until the end of the Fontenoy Archon quest. But before we go, we wanted to address something very relevant to the media that we consume and love, and that is the monumental strikes that are happening right now in the entertainment industry. 
the most well known of which are the SAG AFTRA actors strike and the Writers Guild strike. If there's one thing we want you to take away from this show, it's that your entertainment is made by people, by real people, and they don't always get it right, but they sacrifice a lot and they put a lot of pride into what they do. And it is very rarely very thankful for them. Games like this make money hand over fists, but it doesn't really go to the devs on the ground. And it certainly doesn't really go to the voice actors. Voice actors, not everyone is making Troy Baker money. A lot of these voice actors are living paycheck to paycheck, which isn't hard to do because living in the Los Angeles area is fucking crazy expensive. And those are the kind of people that the matters of dispute these strikes are have been struck on are affected. It's, you know, Brad Pitt is going to be okay. Uh, but, you know, the, the extra who took a gig for $200 and then discovered that that gig included rights to his digital likeness for AI recreations in perpetuity. So in taking a $200 gig, he has put himself out of a job forever. That's fucked. AI is not inherently bad. AI is a tool that can make things incredibly easy for the people and creators who need it most. We have an AI on our team, actually, Gon Yu, who is our automatic subtitle transcriber. She makes editing so much easier and collaborating so much easier than we could possibly do without her. But she's not taking someone's job. And this is a distinction that the AMPTP, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, fails to recognize. Basically, we've already seen issues appear without even AI being involved in the voice acting industry related to Genshin Impact, where we've seen a lack of payments being made to the team that helped bring you this. We've heard from Paimon's VA that they haven't been paid on time, arguably the most important voice of Genshin Impact, the one who you hear the most, the one who you interact with the most. And that's absolutely fucked for a game that is making record-breaking profits that we know last year made over $3 billion. The entity that ended up being the most at fault for this was Formosa, which, which is the voice acting studio that actually books the artist's they are the middleman that MiHoYo pays to pay its voice artists. Now, that is not letting HoYoVerse off the hook at all. It's their project, and at the end of the day, it is their responsibility to make sure that their people get paid for what they do, especially someone as critical as a voice actor. And when you're trying to sell your characters, the voice actor's performance is a massive part of what makes them appealing. Of it's the voice acting in this game has always been strong. It's been stronger than the in-game models. It's stronger than the art style and the writing in many cases. And these people don't deserve to be treated like trash. But the point is, if this was a union project, this injustice of not being paid for up to six fucking months might not have happened. We always knew Genshin was a non-union production because it shares some voice actors with Warframe which is also a non-union production. And if you use union actors, then all the actors on that project have to be union. Uh, incidentally, Warframe is not non-union for nefarious reasons. It's literally because the main supporting character in that game is voiced by a dev who is not a SAG voice actress. And she's so beloved that they don't want to re that no one wants her recast. Genshin is likely a non-union project specifically to underpay their actors to you know save a quick buck for the developers and and maximize the profits for any investors or shareholders for the company which, we should say not, for the not even the dev specifically yeah for the, for the company for the people who make the money the most money off the company so i think one of the things that we can consider when kind of looking at the situation is how can we help how can we spread the word and 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 make sure that the resources are out there for people to unionize so that this type of thing is harder to you know, continue in the future. So if, if you want to make an immediate, tangible uh, contribution for what is currently literally a fight for their livelihoods, you can go to entertainmentcommunity.org, and that is the entertainment community fund. 
this is the main organization that is responsible for collecting funds that will directly support the people striking and allow them to continue making their statement against the AMPTP. In the long run, call for projects to be union, support projects that treat their their workers well. Super Giant Game is infamously one of the best studios as far as fair worker treatment and morale in the video game uh, aspect of A24. The stu- movie studio has unanimously accepted all of SAG-AFTRA's strike demands. Show them that you care. Show them that, that these stories and this, this entertainment means more to you than something that's shot out by a computer. Because entertainment is kind of how we humans share our souls with each other. is by telling stories and making experiences. And Genshin is just one of many. And this whole thing is... It, it, and it is scarier right now than you might re- recognize. And if you can't make a financial contribution, the least you can do is help spread the word. Make sure exactly. that people are aware of the situation that's going on and know where to find the resources to help themselves. So with that <laughs> bit of downer news, we are going to eagerly take a break and get warmed up for the waters of Fontaine. Uh, we will be gradually releasing again the Sumeru 101 spin-off series and you won't hear from us for a while but we will be around you know I'm always poking around on our Twitter at Shade Chamber Pod we have our website shadechamberpodcast.com with the contact form you can get in touch with us we had our first live stream to celebrate our 1000 subscribers and that was a huge success we had such a fantastic time the chat was always popping we're always having such a great discussion it could not have gone better for a debut stream. We are so grateful for that. The VOD should be up by now. And you know, if there's a big desire for it, we might do that a little more often. Oh, I know I got a big desire for it. It was so fun. Yeah, yeah, it was a blast. Yeah, yeah. Keep us in your thoughts. Spread the good word of the Shade Chamber and enjoy our backlog a little bit. See you next season. We will see you in the sea. And in our customary outro, don't be a scab like Ganyu. There you go. Now, <laughs> au revoir, Illuminati. We will au always revoir. have Fontaine. Goodbye. Bon oui. Bon oui to you all. Yeah. That's a good ending. A bientôt. <laughs>